Good morning, everybody. At least it's still morning here in Chicago. Uh, welcome to our conference and our panel on retirement and investing. Uh, I've got three uh, special guests with us today, uh, Christine Benz, Paul Merriman, and Roger Young. Uh, we're going to break this discussion into three different segments, uh, pre-retirement, transitioning to retirement, and in retirement. Um, I'll be monitoring the questions uh, as well as be asking our panelists questions. Um, I'll ask questions specific to each segment throughout the presentation. Um, and then if we have time at the very end, uh, we'll get to some questions that uh, we haven't answered. Uh, but Roger, I'll start with you because you'll be talking about it this afternoon. Um, how does one person figure out how much they need to save for retirement? Well, uh, thanks, Charles. I don't want to spoil it all. Please come to the <laughs> session. But um, th there's a wide range in approaches, and we'll talk about that range. You know, ideally, at some point, you develop a comprehensive financial plan. The amount that you need to have saved is, is one of the insights coming out of, of that process. You know, at the other end of the spectrum, you could just look at a rule of thumb. You know, we, we have savings benchmarks, and you could just see, well, you need around 11 times your ending salary saved. That's not a satisfactory answer for most people, but it, it helps give you some idea. And, and there is a whole range of, of personalized estimates in between there. Uh, no perfect answer. Those approaches can, uh, you know, can diff different ones can resonate with different people and, and at different stages of life. So hope, hope you join me at the, at the later session. And Paul, I know uh, you talked earlier today about just trying to add a little, little bit to your returns year after year. Um, but in terms of the other side, um, what are some of the biggest mistakes you've seen people make when they're saving for retirement? Well, it's a long list. So you're looking for the biggest, the things that are gonna cost them the most money, I assume, Charles. And, and uh, I obviously, because the amount of equities you have in your portfolio are, are going to drive the growth in that portfolio, uh, particularly during this accumulation period, a lot of people do not have enough. As a matter of fact, I am shocked. I see these studies that report that anywhere from 25 to 40 some percent of young people do not want any equities in their portfolio. And we understand why that might be, but that is likely costing them a, a fortune. I do also think that one of the, the least spoken of and most expensive things that people do. And there's no way you can do a study, or it's difficult to do a real study on this, is they allow market timing into their life. And market timing can literally, with one decision, put you at retirement with half of what you should have. And gosh, the, the, the great example would be the people who went to cash in 2008 and early 2009 with the idea of getting back in later. And I talk to people every month that are still trying to figure out how do we get back into the market? And so, you know, I, I think here, here we go again. They're about to get back in at a point where the market could likely go through a, a major correction. So uh, I think that is a terrible, any market timing, uh, has a tendency to to end up hurting people rather than helping. Great. And Christine, um, I know you're a big fan of bucket strategies, and I've seen you write about it for retirees. What about for somebody who's saving for retirement? Could they use those, the same type of strategy to their advantage? I think so. And the basic idea with bucketing is that you are organizing your portfolio by your time horizon. So if you have goals that you'll need to spend your money on within the next, say, five years or fewer, you have no business taking equity risk in that portfolio, in my view, that it's just way too volatile. And so I do think the concept can be uh, instructive for younger investors who invariably have these shorter and intermediate term goals like buying homes and paying for weddings or going back to school. Um, but I think the key idea there is that if they do have those short and intermediate term goals, they need to be taking less risk with that portion of their portfolios. So cash, certainly for those very near term goals, bonds, perhaps uh, if they have goals that are, say, five years away, they may want to pick up a little bit more return 
potential, albeit with the potential for principal related volatility. But if they have a time horizon that short, they should not be in stocks. And unfortunately, I think that we do have a lot of new investors coming on board who have known nothing but a very strong bull market. Mm. We did have that mini bear in March of 2020, but I think that it maybe gave some of them sort of this false sense of security that, oh, bear markets, you know, they last a month, maybe two months, and then they're over. No, in reality, as we all know, it's sometimes two years, three years. And that's when investors can do some of the market timing stuff that Paul was talking about, that capitulation where investors sell themselves out at the bottom. So I think it's really important for young investors to be aware that not all of their portfolios should be in stocks if they have those short and intermediate term goals. It relates to that. We actually got a question in uh, just now um, asking whether or not, uh, Paul, people could take your strategy and then Christine, use your buckets. So Sure. Sure. It, it, it is, uh, the question is how much, whatever you have in equities, how do you invest it? Uh, and how do you then same, you've got the same question with fixed income. How do you invest that? And Christine just has a different way of, uh, making those two work together, but it doesn't change. If I understand the question, uh, the goal of trying to do the right thing with your equity while you have it. Yeah, I would agree. I, I, have used uh, generally pretty utilitarian equity funds in my bucket portfolio. So total international, total US index funds, but I don't see any reason why investors couldn't put their own spin on the ball based on what their biases are. Um, if they wanted to take Paul's advice and include a healthy dose of small value, they could do that. If they wanted to emphasize dividend payers with the equity piece, that seems reasonable too. Um, so I do think that there's room to give some thought to what specifically you, specifically you drop into those buckets. But I think the overarching concept of matching your investments to time horizon works with a variety of underlying investments. Great. Um, and Roger, I know you've written about health savings accounts. Um, would it be fair to describe those as an underutilized uh, tool for saving for retirement? Well, you know, there are a couple of sides of that story. You know, amounts invested in health savings accounts are growing pretty rapidly. They're still tiny in comparison with amounts invested in retirement plans. I know, Christine, you actually just tweeted some stats on, you know, HSAs this, uh, this week. Um, so I, I'm not sure I'd say they're overlooked as much as they're a more recent development. Um, a lot of people who have them need to use them to fund annual medical expenses. You know, to have an HSA, you need a high deductible health plan. So that might mean, you know, you've got to have some saved away for covering those deductibles. Now, for people who are able to invest long term, you know, people who are getting their full 401k match, people, you know, who have, you know, a, a fairly good start on saving for retirement, they have the right type of health insurance plan, you know, the tax benefit of an HSA is hard to beat. So used properly, it's kind of like combining the benefits of Roth and pre-tax contributions. So I, I think, you know, increasingly people are realizing that, but there, there's, there's a limit to the number of people who, who can take full advantage of that triple tax benefit. Okay. Um, and then uh, uh, this is to the panel, I guess an investor is in their 20s and 30s and it's just starting to save for retirement. Uh, what's one piece of advice that you would give them? Well, I mean, this will be really self-serving, Charles, but I mean it. I would say, take a copy of my free book and read the 12 things that you should be doing. But having said that, if they're not going to do that, I would certainly with a young person want to educate them about how investing works regarding investing in equities, the huge advantage of the dollar cost average, the huge advantage of a bear market in the early years. Most young people like old people don't like bear markets, but for a young person, a bear market is a huge advantage if in fact the market's gonna come back in, in the future. So. 
Uh, so I would want to make sure they would know to celebrate a bear market, regardless of what grandma and grandpa and mom and dad are saying. So, uh, and, and of course, I really get upset when I see a lot of bonds in the portfolio of a young investor. Every 10% of bonds is likely to cost a half a percent a year during the years that you do that. Yes, there's a time for bonds later in your life. But if, if, if you give up a half a percent for 10% in bonds, and a lot of people have 30 and 40 and 50% in bonds, that is a huge cost to their financial future. Roger, Christine, anything you want to add? Sure, I, I would just add, um, you know, take advantage of automatic saving. So, you know, you automatically uh, get going in a 401k plan if you have access to it. Even better, automatically increase your contribution, so percent or two per year. Uh, it's, it's remarkable how quickly that can get you up to, to speed in terms of, of where you want to be on saving. Yeah, I love that comment as well. Just put it all on autopilot. And that's really your best remedy um, from what Paul was talking about, where investors, you know, if they are inclined to capitulate in a down market or not add to investments, if you're on autopilot like that, you're not likely to override those contributions that you've set up. In terms of another piece of advice that I would impart, one is just don't overthink it in terms of the investment mix. I love target date funds. There's been sort of this ongoing de debate in the investment advisory community about whether they're good or bad. And I, I personally think that we do a great disservice to con consumers by suggesting that they're suboptimal choices. They may not be perfect, but I think they are the single best innovation of my lifetime in terms of helping improve outcomes for investors. We think about, or we know what investors did before the advent of target date funds. They would sometimes you know, put 10% in each of the 10 choices without any knowledge of what the underlying investments might be, or, or worse yet, they might just gravitate to whatever, whatever the fund was on the 401k menu that had the highest return over the past five years. That's where I'm putting my money. Target date funds are a great simplified solution. I say use them and we monitor fund flows at Morningstar. We know that most of the dollars are going to the better lineups. They're going to the better providers, the lower cost providers. So I, they're not perfect, but I think that they are a really solid option for younger savers. And if I could add, because I totally agree um, with those comments about being the best investment, uh, particularly for young people uh, to save for the future. Wharton did a study. They looked at a million two accounts at Vanguard. They looked at accounts that had all of the money in target date funds, some of the money in target date funds, and none of the money in target date funds. And they figured that those people who were in target date funds only were about a 2.3% better rate of return per year than the people who didn't have any target date funds. That is a, a game changer because if you can pick up an extra 2% for the rest of your life compared to your neighbor, that's a big deal. You'll be mo moving into a new neighborhood possibly. <laughs> yeah, I think target date funds are really good, especially for people who don't have a good sense of allocation or know where they're going. And I kind of like to equate it to, uh, you know, it might be an off the rack suit and it may not fit you perfectly, but uh, it's better wearing that than showing up to a wedding in a t-shirt and flip-flops. So, <laughs> Right. No. One thing we know from target date fund research too, Charles, is that investors, once they buy them, they tend to sit tight. They, and we know this about 401k participants in general. It's a very inert population in terms of making changes. That turns out to be a great way to invest. And we think that one of the reasons that target date investors do tend to sit tight and not make a lot of allocation changes is that they're seeing less volatile results in their statements 
because their portfolios are sort of inherently diversified, they're not seeing all these moving parts. They're not seeing that, oh, this fund lost 10% last quarter, this other one gained 15%. They're not seeing those swings. And so that tends to just keep them in their seats, which it turns out is, is a great way to invest. Great. Um, I wanna move on to uh, transitioning to retirement and I'll apologize to everybody. Uh, our offices are right by a hospital, so we've got the uh, nice background of sirens. Um, but uh, Paul, I just want to go to you here. Um, transition to retirement, um, at retirement soon after, um, a lot of investors will have a considerable uh, allocation of cash from you know, they sold a house, they rolled over their retirement plan. Um, if they're nervous about putting the money to work, what suggestions would you give them? Well, those would be two very different uh, situations. Let's take the one where they're rolling it over mm -hmm. from a 401k plan. I'm assuming that they had a reason why they had a percentage in equity and a percentage in fixed income uh, in their 401k plan. So if they're rolling it over, I would like to know why they aren't rolling it over and putting it back, right back to work uh, where, where, where they had it. Otherwise, they're a market timer and they better be rethinking the process. Or maybe they have too much uh, exposure to equities in the 401k and they're not sure what they should have uh, in retirement, but it should basically be the same theoretically. Now, the other one is more complex because there are a lot of people who get money from a house who have never been themselves a successful investor. And now for the, for the first time, they're having to make this big decision about how to put this money to work for the long term. I'm assuming it's for the long term. And, and I think if they haven't, if they don't know what to do, they should be working immediately with some sort of a professional. And I'm not talking about somebody who's going to manage their money for the rest of their life, but somebody who will charge them maybe by the hour to go through this and understand the forks in the road in that decision that they make and make sure the decisions are by design and not by default, because if they're by default, they can be bad. When I'm left to give counsel to a do-it-yourselfer who is not going to talk to a professional, I will talk about the implications of dollar cost averaging. Now, we all know the industry tells us that if you got money, put the money to work. Now, I know the studies show that's true, but that doesn't necessarily work emotionally for somebody, in which case dollar cost averaging may make sense. Or how about this? How about go ahead and invest a third of it in whatever the appropriate asset allocation is between fixed income and equity. Maybe you take a third and you dollar cost average over 12 months. Maybe you take the last third and you dollar cost average over 24 months. So it's kind of a, a kind of a diversification in getting the money in. On the other hand, I always tell them, at the end of the two years, when you've done all of these things, understand the market then and only then may collapse. So you 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 never you you never re relieve yourself of not having the risk of a major market decline, which means every investor should have the right amount of fixed income and equity for whoever they are in terms of need and willingness to take risk, and go ahead and put it in the market. Great, and uh, Christine, a relative I just asked uh, Paul, what would you say to someone who's worried that this is a terrible time to retire? Right, we're all teasing for our presentations. Mine will be at 1.30 today, <laughs> and that is the topic of my presentation. What if this turns out to be a terrible time to retire? And for people who are embarking on retirement today, and this is a growing share of our, our population as we have uh, retirement's really escalating over the past year and a half. I guess for that cohort, I have good news and bad news. So the good news is that if you have had stocks in your portfolio, you have enjoyed really nice gains. So your portfolio is larger. I think that's why a lot of people are getting serious about retiring soon because they're looking at those enlarged portfolios. The bad news is that there, I think there's a risk today that new retirees run head, headlong into what retirement researchers call sequence of return risk or sequence risk. And that basically means that you encounter a lousy market at a time when your portfolio is at its largest 
And if your portfolio is too aggressively allocated, you will have no choice but to spend down from shrunken equity assets. So if you're someone who is in that situation where you're embarking on retirement and you want to protect yourself against that possibility, I think that you can think about a couple of different things. One is just to make sure that the asset allocation of that portfolio has enough in safe assets. And that gets back to the sort of bucketing idea. But the idea is that you're holding enough cash, enough bonds, that if in a worst case scenario, a bear market strikes early in your retirement, you could spend through the safer stuff before you would ever need to touch the equity assets. And then a related point relates to withdrawal rates. And that's where some of the research that we've been doing at Morningstar um, points to a lower starting withdrawal for people who are just embarking on retirement. So if someone wants to use sort of fixed real withdrawals, our research would suggest that given the likelihood of not quite great returns from stocks and bonds over the next decade, you'd probably want to have your initial withdrawals be in the neighborhood of like 3.4% if you have a balanced portfolio. Alternatively, you could use some of these um, sort of flexible withdrawal strategies, and that could help you take more out of your portfolio initially and over the lifetime of your retirement. But the trade-off is that you'd need to be willing to really pull in your withdrawals if a weak market materializes. So lots to discuss there, but I do think that prospective retirees should really be doing their homework and thinking about what the next decade might look like for stock and bond returns. And, and Charles, could I just add mm -hmm. one small sure. thing? Uh, we have this new lifetime investment calculator. And one of the things it allows you to do is start any year between, uh, uh, between 1970 and, uh, and 2020. So you can set it up to see what would have happened with different combinations of fixed income and equity. And you can di do different combinations of equities in the equity part. I mean, you can have an all value, you can have a all just S&P 500, whatever. And you can run these numbers. And if it doesn't scare you into, into rethinking how aggressive you are, then we haven't done our work or the market hasn't taught us the lessons that we should have learned. But that calculator, is just marvelous to, to, to do that what if kind of thinking. Great, and Roger, um, you wrote about uh, Roth IRA conversions in last month's AI journal. It's a great article uh, for those who have not read it, um, but could you share some like key insights about uh, uh, considerations you should have? Um, because certainly as you're nearing retirement, there might be that gap where you haven't claimed social security, uh, but maybe you're working less hours or you just left your job. So you have that gap in the lower potential income bracket. Sure, well, thanks. Uh, uh, it was a pleasure to be able to, to put that article in, in the journal. Um, the key consideration is comparing your tax rate when you do a conversion to the effective tax rate later when you know, your tax deferred account distributions would, be, would have been taken if you hadn't done the, uh, the Roth conversion. Now, the challenge is it's hard to predict taxes. It's hard to predict what the statutory rates are going to be. Um, you know, RMDs are a huge factor. You know, RMDs could potentially raise your, your tax bracket at some point. Um, now that the SECURE Act has been passed, your, you know, your beneficiary's tax situation has become more important. Ed Slott talked a little bit about this, a lot about this actually yesterday in his session. He's very gung-ho on, on Roth conversions. I'm not quite as gung-ho, and, and in general, um, but there, there are situations where it does make sense. And people who have a lot of tax deferred assets who will clearly be leaving some of it to the next generation, those people should at least consider doing Roth conversions. And you were right about the timing that, you know, early in retirement, kind of that age 60 to 72 range, and, and even before Social Security, they might be in a lower tax bracket. You know, the more I study it, though, you know, even since I, I initially wrote some of that, that work, uh, the more I believe it, it needs to be part of a broader plan because you do need to factor in your social security claiming decision. Um, you know, to think about your mix of assets. There might be times when it's better to take advantage of capital gains with no taxes on them if you're below that threshold. So there's a lot going on. 
And I wouldn't, I would, I would say to people, don't rely on any illustrations and say, well, this is right for me. You know, even the ones in my own article, I, I wouldn't say just don't, don't just take those as gospel. You know, look at your own situation. Great. To that end, we actually had a uh, question come through um, uh, from Charles, a great first name. Um, and he said he just retired at age 64 with a large amount in his, van in his Vanguard 401k. Um, and he's wondering, would it be best to uh, wait next year till his adjusted gross income is lower to start doing the Roth IRA conversions? Uh, but he's also concerned that federal taxes might go up. Um, and obviously, you know, future taxes always <laughs> a big question. So, you know, I can't give anyone specific advice, even, even with some background like that. Um, but I would say, you know, in someone in that situation, should one, you know, look at their own situation, are they actually going to be affected by, you know, potential tax increases that are being proposed? You know, that's a fairly small population that would be affected. Um, and, and also look at, you know, how, where are you in your tax bracket? Um, you know, if, if you're always going to be in the same tax bracket the rest of your life, you know, you probably don't need to do a Roth conversion and accelerate your taxes. Um, but if there's a chance you or your beneficiaries will be in a higher bracket later, that's where it makes sense. But, it, you know, it's, it's very tough to give, give a person an answer, uh, you know, in, in a panel like this. Charles, if I could just yeah. jump in real quick. Sure. Um, on this issue of tax planning in those early years of retirement, it seems like that is so valuable to get some tax advice about how to take advantage of those pre-RMD, potentially pre-Social Security years. I guess one countervailing force is that's often kind of the pent-up demand years of retirement where people do potentially have bigger expenditures on their horizon than they do later on. They're, they're healthy, they're young, they may want to do travel, especially in the post-COVID <laughs> environment. So those, you know, from sort of a real life standpoint, I think that that's a challenge for people really being able to keep their incomes down in those early years of retirement, because those are, those are the fun years. And if you're feeling healthy and well, don't uh, downgrade that because that is worth spending on uh, during those years as well. Yep. And I'll ask with the panel one question. It's something we get, and I'm sure you all have heard. Um, someone's just retired. Should they start taking money out of their portfolio first or leave it in there and claim social security before full retirement age, which is the age for people who are not familiar with FRA, it's the age that you're eligible for your full benefits. Any, any thoughts? I'm on team delay uh -huh. and I know people don't love to hear this. They mm -hmm. really like the idea of replacing the income that they had while they were working. I think that's very intuitively appealing. Run the numbers, delaying isn't the right answer for everyone, but I often recommend a, a calculator called Open Social Security, which was developed by Mike Piper, who is an, uh, a social security expert and a tax expert. And it really is an interesting tool, especially for married couples, to run your situation through. Um, you'll need to come equipped with some information about your uh, earnings history, but uh, plug your information in and get an answer that way. But oftentimes, especially if you're a healthy person, delaying is a good strategy in part because that increased benefit that you receive is um, a little bit outdated in terms of it giving you a nice boost for delaying. And it was based in part on the fact that interest rates at a point in the past were much lower than they are today. So oftentimes delaying, I think, is the right strategy. I, I would generally concur with that. And I, I would just add, you know, you mentioned married couples and, you know, for a married couple, that, that uh, survivor benefit is, is a huge consideration. You know, if, especially if there's an age gap, um, you know, you really want to think about leaving the surviving spouse as, as large a social security benefit as possible. And, and again, there are reasons not to do it. You want to think largely about your longevity. Um, you know, you, you need to think about whether, you know, what risks are um, you know, most important to you. Are you worried about running out of money or, or are you more concerned with, you know, having that money now to, to spend, like Christine mentioned. So uh, lots of factors, but yes, I would lean toward waiting if, if, it, if it's feasible for most people. Um. Let's just move to end retirement. And I know some questions are coming through. So um, 
we'll get to some of those in this segment and certainly afterwards. Um, and if people have questions they want me to ask, uh, just to all attendees, you can vote on questions. Um, Christine, I'll warn you, there is a question about buckets that's getting voted up. So just be aware. Um, but just to everyone, um, and there's a lot of disagreements about how much should be allocated to equities. Um, I show a chart showing where it's almost all equities to you're really annuity, you're putting almost everything into annuity. Um, what are your thoughts about how much exposure someone should have to equities at retirement? Uh, is that for me, Charles? Uh, for the whole panel, but Paul, let you I'll go start, first. I'll start then. I'm happy to. I, uh, I have been putting on a desk in front of people for years uh, tables that show the different combinations of equity and fixed income. And, uh, and, and, and the risk that is represented by each of those combinations. And then I show them the tables that show the implications of taking out different levels of percentages. And my view is, is that people simply need to get educated on this combination of the, the, risk, the risk relationship between equities and fixed income their willingness to take risk. I used to ask people, is your basic job, your, your objective to beat the market? Is it to get the highest return you can within your risk tolerance? Or is it to find the lowest risk way to get the return that you need to satisfy your needs for life? And you tell me which one of those you are, and I'll tell you how much you should be in, in, in equities. And if you say, I wanna beat the market, then I ask you, how much are you willing to lose? And if you tell me how much you're willing to lose, I'll tell you how much you should be in equities so that you lose that amount. Because if you don't lose that amount, I haven't produced the highest return I can within your risk tolerance. And then they say, whoa, wait a minute. You want me to lose money? Yeah, well, that's the way it works if you tell me you're looking for the highest return. So the person has to figure out who they are and what their, their relationship is with risk and return. And I think then the answer is pretty simple, but it means the hard part is for us, those of us who are teachers, educators, how do we teach this without sitting down with these people one by one? You can do your best, but that's a tough job. I have a way that I like to think about it, which um, really starts with thinking about what your income needs are in retirement in totality. And then subtracting your certain sources of cash flow. So if you have a pension, if you are going to be taking Social Security, perhaps you have some sort of a very basic annuity that is kicking off income, subtract those income sources. And then the amount that's left over is sort of your annual portfolio expenditure, your annual withdrawal. And so the way I like to think about it is, having roughly seven to 10 years worth of that withdrawal in safer assets. They should not be in stocks because stocks are too risky if you truncate that time horizon. So that I think is a way for people approaching retirement to back into a sensible asset allocation framework based on their portfolio spending. I think it's a, a, just an intuitive way to approach it. And I would say, you know, as kind of you're doing that work, really thinking about, well, what can I do to amplify those certain income sources? What, what tools might be in my toolkit? Because I do think that it's a worthy goal to try to have those income sources replace your basic spending. So your mortgage payments, if you have them, your tax payments, insurance, and so forth. So I like it. I like that general framework for thinking about how to asset allocate the portfolio. Spoken as you know, a I, I, good financial planner. That's yeah, exactly that's, that's what you do, and that's wonderful. Yeah, think about your goals first, right? Um, very important. You know, it, I, I will. I, I won't add too much because I think these are all very good thoughts. You know, we we give guidance on you know rough amounts to have in in stocks at different points in your life, and and we say you know, a range of 45 to 65% in stocks in your 60s as you're approaching a typical retirement age. Um, and that, that's a, a wide enough range. It can accommodate some different situations, some different risk tolerance. Um, 
uh, yeah, I just think it's important for people to remember, you know, retirement can last 30 plus years, you know, a decent chunk of that should be for the long term and, and therefore in stocks. Well, and, and of course, the industry, including T. Rowe Price and Fidelity and Vanguard and all of these folks, they offer a glide path that tells them their best minds in their company have decided that this is the right amount of equity and fixed income for the average person. And that's about as good as it gets for the do-it-yourselfer, except that when you go to T. Rowe Price and BlackRock and Vanguard, they have different recommendations that can be significantly different in the amount of fixed income or equity. So the glide path should theoretically be a, a great guide, but it might not be the right guide just because of your risk tolerance. Yeah. And I do think the retirement years can be a little bit of a game changer in terms of um, one size fits all asset allocations that there you really do want to think about your own situation. So say in an ideal world, you're a retired college professor and you have a pension that's meeting all of your living expenses. Well, if I look at that, that person should have, assuming that he or she can tolerate it, a really equity heavy portfolio. But if I'm a more standard person where I'm withdrawing from my portfolio to for a lot of my living expenses, well, there, you know, a, a lower equity allocation would be appropriate because I want to protect my near-term spending needs. Great. And Christine, I know you recently came out with a study about how much investors can withdraw without incurring the risk of outliving their money. Um, is there some key points you could share? Yeah, I, I mentioned Charles, 3.4% was sort mm -hmm. of the sobering uh, data point. A lot of people know the 4% guideline for retirement portfolio withdrawals, but our research would suggest when you kind of look forward and think about the very low bond yields that we have today, as well as not inexpensive equity valuations, that new retirees would be wise to be a little bit lower than 4%, assuming that they want to take some sort of a fixed real withdrawal from that portfolio. So if they're using sort of the Bill Bangen 4% guideline strategy. On the other hand, we also explored some of the more flexible strategies where if you are willing to pull back on your withdrawals in weak markets, um, you can potentially take more in better market environments. So we explored some of the trade-offs associated with those variable strategies because a lot of the retirement research does point to the benefits of being able to be a little bit flexible. And I know T. Rowe Price has done some valuable research along these lines. But um, one thing we wanted to talk about was sort of the quality of life issues that can accompany that variability. So if we're saying that uh, we need you to take your withdrawal down from 60%, $60,000 this year to $40,000 next year, well, what we were exploring is that's a big deal for some people, right? For everyone in terms of the quality of their life. So we were trying to um, show that yes, flexibility is good to the extent that you can be flexible, that's a benefit, but there are trade-offs, especially for folks who have tighter plans where they don't have the latitude to rein in expenses. It's, it's a bigger deal for them to uh, use a flexible approach. Great. And Paul, um, obviously, out, besides out, uh, living your savings, um, yep. there's also the risk of cognitive decline. In fact, I just heard today that uh, Tony Bennett uh, has been living with Alzheimer's for several years. Mm. Um, sad to see a great musician uh, suffer through that. But um, I, I guess at what point, if you're a retiree, do you start considering maybe handing over control of your portfolio to either a planner or someone else you trust? Well, a friend of mine who has passed on, Lou Mandel, uh, who was one of the actually the founders of the financial literacy movement many decades ago, a, a professor uh, out of New York, uh, he wrote a book called What Do I Do When I Turn Stupid? And uh, as opposed to 60 or 70 or whatever. But, you know, I really believe that all of us do it yourselfers or those who want to look to, to professional help of some sort, we should, even before we have come to that point, have established a relationship with somebody who can check what we're doing. Uh, do it yourselfers like to think they 
they maybe know more than they really do. And a good professional can spend an hour or two. And I'm talking about not again, not somebody who's trying to, to manage your money for a lifetime, but to, to, to take a good close look at what you're doing and give you some advice. I also think, uh, and I used to do when I was an investment advisor, I also think it's important for do-it-yourselfers if they've got enough money to take a piece of money. I used to have a minimum of $100,000 uh, uh, decades ago as an advisor. And I would have people, let me manage the $100,000. They might have had one or two million more sitting over there. I would manage that. And the reason they were having me manage that is they wanted somebody to be there to work with a surviving spouse. And they wanted the spouse to get to know the advisor. And I was always willing to do that. It was never an all or nothing kind of situation because I understood they wanted to really manage their own money. But I think that relationship can be very important uh, to, the, to the family uh, when in fact the, the, the person who's the expert on investing is, is no longer there. But just in terms of even the person who is the expert uh, how are we going to know that we are losing it and starting to, to fail? And according to the study, I remember in Lou's book, I think it was at 53, you're going, you start, you're downhill from 53 on. And here I am at 77 wondering, well, should I have an advisor to work with me? Not only for me, but for the family. And I've come to the conclusion, yes, there should be somebody there. And I, and I don't really think it's a matter of turning your life over to those people, but let them become part of your life so you get to know them and they know you. Now, that's invaluable advice. And I just want to point out um, to everyone here that just create a list of all the professionals you work with and, and tell your spouse or your heirs where it's located at. It's a very simple thing, but uh, it's invaluable, especially if something happens to you sudden for them to just have that. So Paul, I think that's great advice about taking the spouse alone and along and making sure they have that relationship started. I agree. I, I love all that advice. I had a dad who uh, experienced cognitive decline later in life. And I often think that um, it was about as good as it gets if someone is going through that in terms of I was a really close to my mom and dad and uh, had been involved in helping them manage their finances before they encountered cognitive decline. But I often think what would have happened if I hadn't been as on board and in line with their plan. Um, and so I do think it's so valuable to start getting to know financial advisors. If you're the investment savvy partner in your family, you're by far better equipped to choose a good quality financial advisor than, than your spouse might. Um, I think oftentimes spouses have an inclination if they're not comfortable with financial matters, they will choose the person who they respond to and connect with emotionally. And that person may be great from an investment standpoint, but he or she may not be great. So if you're the investment savvy person, it's incumbent upon you to do that due diligence of advisor selection, document the heck out of who you deal with, as well as what you have. I like the idea of creating a master directory that documents just in very broad terms, here is where we hold our assets. So it's not kind of a paper chase for your kids to have to sort out after you're gone. Um, but laying that very simple groundwork and also simplifying the plan as you age, I think is another way to protect yourself against cognitive decline. It's not foolproof, but by reducing the number of moving parts, reducing the need for ongoing oversight, I think that that can just be hugely beneficial. Absolutely. And I just want to, one question had come through, I'll answer it. Uh, we actually had someone write in a uh, newbie question um, and wanted to know uh, where the withdrawals uh, from the portfolio came from. And just to be clear to everyone, so when we're talking about, Christine mentioned the 3.4% 3, 3 withdrawal rate. So we're talking from the total portfolio value, and it doesn't matter if it's coming from dividends, you're selling securities, it's whatever the value of portfolio is at retirement, it's that percentage of the value. So that's where the money's coming from. And um, Charles, can I add one sure. more thing about yeah. this withdrawal rate? Because it's one of my favorite topics. Um, 
I found, we found, and we have tables. This is another set of tables we have. When you oversave, you have a luxury, the greatest financial luxury I think you can have, and that is the ability to take out more than you need. If you take a person who's got a million dollars and they need 40,000 to live on, and they don't have, they got to take the 40,000 out, they got to take the, the adjustment to inflation. There's pressure on that portfolio. But if you had a million and a half instead of a million, and you had a cost of 40,000, now all of a sudden, you can take out 5% of a million and a half or $75,000. And if your portfolio is not too aggressive, you're not at great risk of taking out 5% because you only need 40,000. And so it is that ability to save so that a, a larger percentage, that's what my wife and I take. We take 5% the first week of every year. Stupid to do because it's costing us money because we're taking that money out at the first of the year that we could have left in there to continue to grow. I don't want to have, I don't want to think about that money on a monthly basis. I want to have it right there. No, that's what we have for the year. By the way, we put that in a short-term bond fund and, 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 and get a little bit extra there. But the bottom line is we're taking more than the textbooks say that we should, but we're doing that because we waited to retire until we had more than enough. And I know John Bogle was really focused on enough. I am focused on trying to get people to have more than enough for this very reason. That's such a good point. One, one thing I want to piggyback on is this whole idea of like where that withdrawal comes from. And that's one thing we touch on in our paper. Yields are so low. So if you show me a portfolio that has anything close to a 3.4% withdrawal rate today, that is an incredibly risky portfolio. And that, I, I think, speaks to the virtue of just using a total return approach to managing your portfolio and managing your in-retirement withdrawals as opposed to relying on current income. I know a lot of retirees take comfort in having at least some of their withdrawals coming from current income fine. But if you're trying to get your whole withdrawal from current income today in this environment, I think that that leads to a quite risky looking portfolio. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, so I'll, another question, Christine, I'll tell you this has 21 votes. So um, they said, Christine Spence's bucket strategy is wonderful, uh, but in light of the low interest rates and looming inflation, what should be in the fixed income bucket? Yeah, good question. And I do think about this. Um, in fact, I was talking with Wade Fow, who's a retirement researcher about this issue, and he feels that the drag of having a lot in cash, certainly, and a lot in bonds is a risk to a bucket strategy. So in my sort of baseline bucket portfolios, I've got like 10 years worth of portfolio withdrawals in cash and high quality bonds. I think you could reasonably shrink that a little bit, given how low the return potential is from that portion of the portfolio, I think you could take it down to like seven years worth of portfolio withdrawals in the safer assets. I think annuities, and I know a lot of retirees, a lot of folks in the audience certainly have these marked with a skull and crossbones, but I think annuities might make sense as a, as a means of sort of augmenting the certain other sources of income that you'll have coming into your plan. I think that the very low yield environment does embellish the case for annuities because you still get that longevity risk pooling um, that comes along with an annuity product um, that enlarges your payout versus just having the money in, in cash and fixed income assets. So those are a few things that I would think about in this very low yield environment. But I guess a point I would come back to, a broader point, is that the point of those safe assets is not to be any sort of great return generator for your portfolio. We know that they're not. We know that their return potential is really quite low but they are there to be stability and something that you could spend through if in a worst case scenario, a weak equity market occurs early on in your retirement. By the way- I'd also think about um, 
Okay, sorry, Paul. Uh, just briefly, you, you might also think about, you know, diversifying within bonds, you know, globally, you know, some, some in high yield, uh, some in, you know, banknotes that, uh, that are more protected against uh, interest rate changes. You might think about total return strategies. So you just might need to think a little more broadly about um, that relatively safer part of the portfolio. Nothing's perfectly safe, but, uh, but relatively safe. I think to add to, to Christine's comment about annuities and the, and the skull and crossbones, I, I agree that that, uh, that, is, that is really not appropriate because it's a wonderful product. I've never sold one, by the way, but I've recommended a lot of people own one and you got to know how to buy them right. But I have found, I used to ask in workshops, how many of you have a pension? And, and i these were older people and a lot of them had a pension. And uh, I would say, how, how important has the pension been? And how much, you know, how much comfort has it been to know there's a check coming in every month? And yeah, I mean, the hands would go up and people were very emotional about the importance of that pension. And what people, I think, oftentimes forget is an annuity, a single premium annuity, life annuity, is nothing but buying a pension. And I don't know how to get that kind of a return. At my age, I think I would probably get 8% a year. If I put in $100,000, I'd get $8,000. Well, people who can only get 2 or 3% a year, but they don't have enough money, those people are in trouble who don't have enough money. And very often, the annuity is really about the only way they're going to get the cash flow they need to give that return, return, and as Christine said, it's because of the way that these annuities work. It is a pool, and you're being paid back some principal, and you want to be one of the winners who lives a long time because the people who only live a week after they buy their buy their uh, their policies, the money's gone into the pool for everybody else. It's a sweetheart deal, but for crying out loud, don't pay a commission to get in them. Also remember that uh, you know delaying Social Security is is perhaps the best uh, annuity you can buy. Absolutely, yeah, Absolutely. effectively. And it's it's free compared to buying one. No expense ratios. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Paul, this is to you. Um, this got a lot of votes too. Uh, do target date funds have any application for those in retirement, uh, such as um, he wrote early seventies and age? Well, I think so, because it's a balanced fund. The, the, most, the most successful video that I ever did was done for 10 people at the Senior Center on Bainbridge Island. And it was my favorite 12 Vanguard re funds for retirees. We put it up on the internet, and we've had almost 100,000 people watch that. And all it is is a series of different kinds of balanced funds at Vanguard that you can use. Some are fixed balanced, some are like the target date fund. It's changing balanced. But you know what that target date fund, I don't care if you're 20 or you're 80, what they're trying to do for you is to manage your money for the, the level of risk you should have. And so it works as well at 80, although you might not be comfortable with 30% in equities, they think you should have 30% in equities. There's a reason why they believe that. And maybe they know more about what you need than you do. And you have to ask yourself, if you're going to go pick a balanced fund, what level of balance do you want? You don't want 30? Then buy a balanced fund like uh, their income fund at Vanguard, which is 20% in uh, equities and 80% in fixed income. But all of those, those balanced funds are great. The beauty of the target date fund, it continues to worry about you as you get older and, and, and will tend to be more and more conservative. To the best of my knowledge, as low as they go is 30% uh, in equities. And Roger, what about at T. Rowe Price? How, how low do you go? You guys are typically a little more aggressive. We are, I, yeah, it's somewhere in there. And that's, that's not my, my job to, to run those at zero. But yeah, some, something in, in that ballpark. Um, and I, I would add, you know, you, you probably, if you have them in retirement and, and you know, of course you have to take RMDs and you have to 
um, think about um, you know, how you're going to fund your, your lifestyle. So it might take a little bit more work and you might wanna have some things other, you know, in addition to target date type of products. Uh, but yes, they, they can be a, a you know, foundation for you. One thing I don't think those all-in-one funds don't get enough credit for is just the rebalancing that they do for you behind the scenes. That in a March 2020, where stocks went down very quickly, they're in there buying for you. And that's such a powerful thing, not necessarily specifically for retirement, but whatever your life stage, that fund that is going to step up and be a buyer in a weak equity market, that's such a tremendous thing to do for your plan. Um, so there's a lot to be said for that rebalancing that's going on under the hood. It's not something that investors necessarily feel like doing themselves in such environments. Okay, um, that's great. Um, Another question, Christy, this is addressed to you, but I'm gonna address it to the full panel. Um, and it's a good question. Uh, what do you recommend for investing RMD cash distributions in this environment? So if someone's taking their RMD, they don't need to spend the whole RMD, which is, for those of unfamiliar, it's a required minimum distribution, money you're required to take out of, not only your IRAs, but if you have a Roth 401k, you're required to take it. Um, what People who don't need to spend it, um, how do they, what should they do with it? It's a good question. It's a lot of retirees are in this sort of high class situation where their RMDs are kind of a nuisance that they boost their tax bill. Um, but you can reinvest the money and you should if, if, if you have extra. And so I would say um, you want to think about your uses of those funds. If you are saving for children, grandchildren, um, a taxable account will tend to be the uh, most typical receptacle for uh, those proceeds. Um, and you can invest pretty tax efficiently there using index funds or exchange traded funds for the equity exposure. Alternatively, one thing people don't think about um, is that if either they or their spouse has earned income at all, you can actually reinvest those funds in a, an IRA. Um, and you might wanna use an, a Roth IRA there because the RMDs wouldn't apply. But I think that that's another strategy that can sometimes apply. Um, oftentimes 72 year olds aren't working at all, but sometimes their spouses are. And so that's a neat strategy as well. But think about what you'll be using the money for and use that to allocate the assets. And just a quick addition. If you are asking them to make the decision whether they're investing for themselves or their children or their grandchildren, you should also, I think, ask them in the choice of the equities, do you want to invest as if you are in fact investing for them in something that's more aggressive or do you want to invest for you in something that's a more conservative equity holding? I encourage them when they have more money than they need to invest uh, or by the way, even better, give the money to the grandkids to put into a Roth IRA or something where it's doing some good for the long term. But you could take a, a different kind of equity depending on who you're investing for, really. One quick thought I'll add, if you're, if you're charitably inclined, you might consider a qualified charitable distribution and that counts for your required minimum distribution. Um, if, if you have, you know, clearly money in the, the RMDs that, that you don't need for, for living. Yeah. It's a nice tax break, you know, tax benefit to you. And we're almost out of time. So I'll ask you all, um, if you had to give, I guess, one short piece of advice by either investing for or in retirement or guidance, we'll say, um, what would it be? Get some help. I think is one, one piece of advice that I would impart based on my own family experience, the fact that um, I did have firsthand experience with someone I really adored who had cognitive decline and I was glad I could be there as his helper, but not everyone has that. So, so get some help, get a second set of eyes on your plan. And I think you need to check a list of the things you should not do and do as an investor. And even if you've been doing it for a long time, are you really doing the right things and maybe make some adjustments based on, on the new things we've learned about investing over the last 50 years? A lot of people are still living way back in the old days. And I, I would suggest take a look, should you be making some changes now? 
And, and just one quick addition, uh, think about your vision for retirement. So it's not all about the numbers, even though that's kind of what I do. Uh, you know, think, think about, you know, who you spend time with, what you want to do, where you want to do it, uh, why, you know, purpose in, in retirement, you know, having that, the, that vision defined can, uh, can really help you get more satisfaction out of your retirement. Great advice. Uh, thank you, Roger. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Christine. Uh, thanks for all the attendees. Um, we appreciate it. It's a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thanks so much. Thanks. Nice work, you guys. That was fun. It was great. Yes. We could, uh, could be on the panel with you. Thanks. It was great to Take care, you guys.